Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the graphic novel, um, Creating, Selling, and Cross-Platforming Intellectual Property panel here. Um, and what we wanted to do is we're going to walk you through just a few slides before we get into the Q&A, which I know you guys are most excited about. Um, but first of all, we want to say thank you for taking the time to join us here. And also um, thank you to those who have been in past panels and attended these, because we know there's a handful of people who have been to the ones in the past and we're always thankful for that. Um, one of the reasons that we create these panels in addition to sharing information and making our creative community stronger is we also wanna make sure that there's a really great work, ability for you to network with each other. And the virtual world is a little bit more difficult than in the real world, you know, we did in the past, but actually in the virtual world, it might be easier. We encourage you to go into the chat section on the bottom, introduce, say your name, introduce yourselves, where you're from, um, encourage to talk with each other about your projects. Um, if you do have a Q&A questions for the panelists, don't put it into the chat, put it into the Q&A. There's actually a separate icon on the bottom you know, that you'll see there just for those specific questions, and we'll try to highlight those during the conversation itself. Um, but again, we encourage you to interact with each other because, you know, it's all about helping each other and making our, our creative community stronger and getting those stories out there. Um, just a little bit about, about Jennifer and I, um, we are the co-founders of the business of creating, and it really is here to, to um, help this creative community, whether it's across film, TV, digital, and what we're also really big about is um, having those practical action steps, which Jen is always reminding me about because it's very often, you know, it's not about just telling war stories. It's really to say, okay, great, those are interesting, but okay, wait, I have this project, you know, I want to get this made, you know, what are those things that can help me with that? So that's what we really are about. We do it across multiple areas from sizzle reels we've done in the past with um, financing and production and unit photography and, um, you know, animation, you know, and um, distribution. So there's a few. And if you ever have any ideas and thoughts that you would like to see in future ones, feel free to let us know. We're always open to new ideas. Um, we are very thankful for our partners here, um, the Writers Guild Foundation. They've been always a wonderful partner over the last three, I want to say three plus years, right? <laughs> you know, so um, I wanted to kind of um, hand it over to them and um, have, let them explain a little bit better than I ever could about their wonderful organization. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Enid Portuguez. I'm from the Writers Guild Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization based in LA. And as the slide says, our mission is to preserve and promote the craft and history of writing. Uh, we host regular virtual events, which is which are all open to the public. You're all welcome to join and listen to conversations with film and TV writers, as well as entertainment executives. Um, and if you are in LA, uh, our library is back open again by appointment only. So I will throw that link in the chat to book your appointments and come in and read the thousands and thousands of scripts, books, and uh, development materials that we have. So thank you again for being here. And yeah, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'll put all that information in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Enid. And just to underscore what she said, I mean, if you really do get the chance to ever go visit them, I mean, it is the breadth and depth of information that they have is really phenomenal. And you can just kind of go in there and pick out scripts on TV and, and, and um, film. And it's just, it's, just, it's incredible. So definitely go and check them out. Um, obviously, this is the panel, if you know what, if you're signed up for this, you probably know what the panel is about, you know. Um, but you know, the good thing is that this panel is hot on the heels of Comic Con from San Diego, which some of our panelists have right on, you know, we're just there, which is that largest um, comic convention in the US and leads perfectly into our panel. Um, we know everyone is familiar with Marvel and DC, right? And comics that have been converted into film TV properties like Spider-Man and Ant-Man, Avengers, Batman, Wonder Woman, Spider Superman. Um, by the way, apologies to the DC fans. I'm only using these Marvel screenshots here just to show the breadth even within one universe, you know? So don't get mad at me. I know like there's like the wars between Marvel and DC, but you know, this really panel is, you know, for those who aren't big like Marvel and DC yet, you know, this is what this panel is really about. You know, and you know, here are ones you may not have heard of or that were either converted into film or TV or, or are in production. And we just wanted to highlight just this to kind of show you kind of some of the things we're talking about. Like, for example, even if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a lot of them are paired together with what the 
the graphic novel comic is, and then even the um, movie title is. Um, White Bird, A Wonder Story, which is actually is an upcoming American war drama directed by Mark Forster, and it's based on a 2019 graphic novel in the same name. And the movie starring Helen Mirren will be released in theaters October 14th of this year by Lionsgate participants. Um, the Dark Tower and Sin City, interesting enough, those are two movies I actually worked on. It's really fascinating working with original art, you know, and, and seeing how it's adapted into film and how to use both materials to help market a film. Um, just, just loved working on those films. The Walking Dead, you know, this is more of a AMC television series from 2010 through 2022, and it loosely follows the storyline of the comic book. Um, the comics began in 2003, and the series ran for 193 issues. Um, ones that are in production that you see on the bottom right, um, Lumberjanes, it's a girl-centric comic series that ran 75 issues with a one-shot finale in December 2020, ending in a six-year run. HBO Max, as of most recently, and things change, right, is in development of the live-action adaptation of the comic series. Um, and then the other thing to note is American Born Chinese. It's a graphic novel released in 20, 2006 and was a finalist for the National Book Awards in the category of Young Literature. It won a 2007 Michael Pritz Award and the Eisner Award for Best Graphic Album New. Um, in 2021, Disney Plus ordered a TV adaptation of this graphic novel. So you might see these in the next, you know, next few years, hopefully. But I put Lumber James and American Born Chinese here just to show that there are recent examples that are, are in the works and you should keep an eye out for them. And my friend Jill Gilbert told me about these, but they're really important because they're stories about characters that are normally not told. And very often we hear from panelists, how do I get my stories that I don't see normally out there? Um, and what I'll do also is I'll put in links into the chat after I'm done talking um, that aren't like that are Marvel or DC based, you know, that are converted graphic novels. And there's a, there's a ton of them. I mean, there's just like a huge one. And I know the panelists can talk about those too. Um, these next two slides are just to give you a context of how big and, you know, these comic and graphic novel sales are. Um, and these are stats from Comicron. Um, sales of comic graphic novels grew over 60% in 2021, um, even taking into account of COVID where physical stores were shut down. Remember when everything was shut down, if it were, it's only two years ago. Um, in 2020, the numbers exceeded 2019s by a hefty margin, and the sales were especially strong in the manga category and periodical comics also had a great year, easily beating 2019. But basically look at that spike that you see there in 2021. So when looking at the formats, meaning like books versus digital downloads, you'll see graphic novels on the top with the majority of the revenue, um, followed by comics in the middle and then digital comics. Um, sales through book channels, including book fairs, which are back in operation, grew at a blistering 81% pace. Digital growth was slower, and but coming off a gangbuster year in 2020 during shutdowns. And I love this stat mainly because I'm still old school and I love the feel of paper. So that's why I love to see when you see that the graphic novel and book sales. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way and giving kind of context and perspective as we head into the panel itself, I would love to introduce you and like to introduce you to the wonderful, amazing friend, moderator Jennifer Mangan, who will then do the intros of the panelists and run. And she's a lot better at it than I ever am. And you'll hear from her and I'll be able to shut up. Um, but Jennifer is a writer and producer who owns the independent production company, Beautiful Day Productions. I always love that name. So aspirational, which focuses on material that uplifts and empowers women through comedy and sci-fi and fantasy. After she graduated from Distinction with UCLA Extension in Business and Management and Entertainment, she co-founded and produced the Women in Film Mini Upfronts, promoting female content creators via red carpet industry screenings and trailers and sizzles for unproduced projects. Recognizing the need for creatives to gain practical advice and guidance from seasoned entertainment execs in order to market and sell their projects, Jennifer co-founded and moderates these business of panel, these business of creating panels together. Currently, Jennifer's sci-fi TV fantasy show, um, sci-fi fantasy television show, Animal Magnetism, is in development with executive producer Randy Greenberg. Hopefully, Randy's listening in on here. Yeah. Right? If you are, is he Jen? Do we see him here? Is he here? He could wait. Um, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Not sure. Well, Randy's great. He's part. Of, he, he's responsible for the Meg franchise, The Tale of Dark and Grim, and Cowboys and Aliens. With that, I hand this over to Jennifer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm, I'm so excited to learn from these amazing experts. Uh, first up, we have the fabulous David M. Booer. Everybody, a round of applause for David. David. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> Yay. 
uh, David writes uh, for TV, film, and comics. He co-created and wrote one of my faves, uh, the fantasy Canto from IDW, which I was so happy he told me is now in development as a motion picture with Westbrook Studios. And David is, of course, adapting the screenplay. David's credits also include all new Firefly from Boom Studios, Killer Queens from Dark Horse Comics, and the comic adaptation of Joe Hill's novella, Rain, for Image Comics. Prior to writing full-time, David was a practicing attorney for 18 years. Everybody, yay! Welcome, David! It's never too late, everybody. As you're, you're watching, it's never too late to be a writer. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Encouraging words before we've even asked official questions. I'm so there. All right, everybody, second up on my hot seat, it's Amanda Dybert. Everybody, welcome, Amanda! Hi. Amanda is a television and comic book writer. Her credits are, oh my God, I gotta have to take a deep breath. Look at this. Comic book writing includes the New York Times bestselling series, DC Superhero Girls, Wonder Woman, Agent of Peace, DC's The Doomed and the Damned, Teen Titans Go, Batman and Harley Quinn, and Wonder Woman 77, and the New York Times number one bestselling anthology, Love is Love for DC Comics, Hyperspace Stories for Lucasfilm Dark Horse, Red Sonja for Dynamite, and John Carpenter's Tales for a Halloween Night, Volumes 2 through 7, for Storm King Comics, as well as the graphic novel Work for a Million for Penguin Random House's McClellan and Stewart. Uh, Amanda is currently writing He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, uh, for which she also wrote the graphic novel tie-in Legends from Crest Castle Grayskull, and another yet-to-be-announced series on Netflix. Uh, other TV writing credits include work for CBS, Sci-Fi, Hulu, Quibi, and four years as the writer for former Vice President Al Gore's annual climate broadcast, 24 Hours of Reality. Everybody, let's welcome Amanda. Okay, third up in my hot seat, I've got Dinesh Shandasani. Everybody, welcome. Hi, <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Oh, gosh, my pleasure. Uh, so Dinesh is the co-CEO and co-chief executive, excuse me, co-chief creative officer at Bad Idea. Uh, Dinesh is a veteran entrepreneur and entertainment executive who spent more than a decade spearheading the rebirth of Valiant Entertainment, uh, which, as we know, is the best-selling comic book publishing house behind the largest independently owned superhero universe. Now, as one of the principal architects of Valiant's acquisition and rebirth, Dinesh led the iconic comics brand through a groundbreaking run of creative, commercial, and critical successes. <laughs> yeah, okay. That culminated with the company's sale in early 2018 and the start of production on Valiant's first ever feature film, Bloodshot, with starring the amazing Vin Diesel. All right, now, in addition to founding Bad Idea, I know this man is a, a whirlwind of amazement here. It's Jennifer, I'm uh, gonna take you everywhere. This is amazing. <laughs> Watch out, we're gonna have a whole series with all y'all. Uh, so Dinesh also co-founded Hive Mind, the Los Angeles-based production company specializing in high-profile genre content for film and television, alongside former Universal Pictures president Sean Daniel. You may have heard of some of these shows, y'all. Uh, we have The Expense, uh, Expanse on Amazon and The Witcher for Netflix with additional projects in the pipeline. Holy cow, everybody. Let's welcome Dinesh Yambasani. Thanks, guys. And my my partner in crime, yes. it's Michael Fisk. Uh, <laughs> I was I totally forgot about it. I was about to like, just like, ready for the next one, ready for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, everybody, as you know, Michael is my partner in crime. He's the co-founder of our Business of Creating panel series. Uh, in addition to that most important role, Michael is also a senior marketing executive in the entertainment industry, having spearheaded over 450 marketing campaigns for studios like Sony Pictures, Lionsgate, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, and currently for MGM. Michael also runs Intermark, the international consulting practice focusing on helping filmmakers, producers, directors, and distributors with long-term marketing and strategy. His passion is making your passion project succeed. Uh, fun fact, his favorite marketing campaigns that he's worked on are, of course, the James Bond franchise. He's worked on the last six of those. La La Land and more recently House of Gucci and Licorice Pizza. 
Holy cow, everybody. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, you guys. Okay, let's dive deep. Let's learn. Let's, let's pull up the, let's go up the questions. That's us here. We'll pull these up a little bit here, and then Jen will take it down when we're ready. Okay, so uh, yeah, so quick overview questions. Uh, what exactly is IP, intellectual property? How is it defined in context of creating the stories? Um, who would, you know, can we jump in with that quick one really quick? Give us a, a Miriam Webster definition. David, Amanda, who, who's gonna answer here? See what I did there? I, I punted to you guys. I don't know, we were, know if the lawyer had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, I, I don't, I, I think it's kind of an amorphous definition of IP. I think when you're talking to Hollywood executives, it's kind of this buzzword for, um, pre-existing material. So it could be a book, it could be a podcast, it could be anything. But, you know, when I when I talk, I'm sure, Dinesh and Amanda, you have the same experience when we talk to studio executives about anything. They, their two questions are, what do you have for us and what is it based on? So mm -hmm. that second question almost always refers to, well, what is the IP behind this? So, I, I mean, there's a legal de definition of intellectual property, which has to do with copyrights and trademarks and patents. All of those fall within that umbrella. But I think probably for our purposes here, IP really means something like the comic book, the characters. What is it based on when you're doing, when you're thinking about an adaptation? Yeah, I, I would say also uh, emotional connection, right? Like Canto is a book that people absolutely love and, and it creates value in terms of ip because of that so that's probably one of the things that at least in hollywood they're, they're very excited about yeah. yep. fantastic okay great um just you know i know when i'm pitching the tv show um that i'm working on to make it all about me y'all um but i know a lot of times they're saying david exactly what you were saying and dinesh what you were saying what's it already based on where's the graphic novel where's the other format that already has uh, has followers and has people that can't wait to see the next episode or the next issue, uh, as David was reminding me. So I, I, that I found was always interesting. Wait, it can't just be an original idea. It's even a better selling point, which, oh, hello, how are we pitching? That's like on this next page. Uh, but yeah, when you're pitching it, they're really wanting to know what else is it already based on, not just the script. So Good and bad news right from the start, y'all. All right, so uh, if I'm creating this graphic novel, can't I just do it all myself? I saw Final Draft has a, a template. I'm set. What? There, there's more than one role? Tell me more. Who do I need to hire and when? Well, I guess it depends on uh, how multi-talented you are, because there are people who there are people who do uh, write and draw their own comics. Obviously, I am not one of those people. Um, but you've got, I mean, you as the as the writer, you have your your graphic novel or comic book script, and then um, oftentimes you have an editor who is the person that is keeping everyone um, together, unified <laughs> on deadline, giving notes, keeping the whole project uh, kind of sailing smoothly. Uh, most importantly, you're going to have well say most importantly for me because I can't draw. Um, you're going to have an illustrator who is the person that's drawing it, but sometimes even that can be broken up into inker, penciler. So penciler is the person that like draws it. Then you've got the inker that is the inks colorist. Some people do um, all of those together. Some people do all of them, but then sometimes work with a colorist and sometimes work like that can get kind of flexible. But so you have up to three artists doing those things. And then you've got your letterer which is the person that literally is doing the lettering, which is an art form of itself, which I think is something that um, if you're not familiar with the industry is something that a lot of people don't realize. Like I'm not the person who's writing the words in the bubbles. That's an art form because it has to do with like the impact, the font, size, the size, how to make sure that you've got it on the page in a way that the reader is like reading it properly, that it flows, that it's not interfering with uh, visually interesting or important things in the um, in the artwork, and I think did I did I miss yeah. other people? <laughs> I, I will just add as far as lettering goes, um, folks oftentimes do not think about lettering, and my favorite anecdote is you almost never notice good lettering 
but you almost always notice bad. So if, if you're not really thinking about it, that means the letterer has done a very good job on your comic. Mm. But if you're getting any feedback about lettering, it's, yeah, you know, there's, there, there might be something to look at there. Um, and once all of everything that Amanda described is done, then you go to editorial. And so you have an editor who's on board. You might have a layout designer. You'll have somebody who designs the title, you know, style of the title, all the, in, in the inside front cover, the inside back cover, the back cover. And, and then you have your publisher. So it, it's, it, takes an enti- it takes a whole industry to raise one comic book, right? So it, it's a huge team. And if you are one of the lucky ones to um, have the talent to also draw and letter and write your graphic novel, kudos to you. But I am right there with Amanda where I get the scripts out try my best on those and then send it to the team and hope for the best. Right. But but it's interesting because the creative component is very small, right? It's, it's your editor, you, your artist, the colorist, the letterer, they have a creative input, but not in that initial phase. So it is a small team, unlike film and TV. So you can keep a real strong uh, point of view in terms of vision. And then you've got all these other components later. So it it is, I was listening to you and I was thinking it is a big group of people, but it always feels small. Interesting looking at the chats, letterers are in high demand. There's people wanting to find ones there. So if you know of any, look in the chat, there's people looking. And I can tell you, yeah, I I was just gonna say, I can tell you that I've worked with two letterers in my time on my personal creator owned projects. And that's that's because they're wonderful and I will never, ever, ever let them go. (laughs) Sorry. Just so you know, fair warning. So, you're but like, so you don't know anybody. So you're like, I don't know any letterers. <laughs> like, it's a fascinating question because letterers are perhaps the easiest component to find. The work they do is um, is very fast. So they can they can letter a ton of books. The most important thing they do is is balloon placement to track uh, where the eye is meant to lead from on a page so that you're following the, the action on a page. And they're very good at that. But um, I'm surprised to hear that there are many studios out there that um, that have groups of letterers that will that will work on on books and they're not picky and they're very strong. Um, maybe something that we should all Amanda and, and uh, David and I should be thinking about helping letterers get more out there in terms of of, of promoting themselves. Yeah, because it sounds like it's, uh, it's um, chat. You can certainly um, jump in here, but it sounds like it's less about them being a letters being available, more about just how do you find them. How do you find somebody who has a skill set? I'm raising my hand. I'm the moderator, but I'm calling on myself, y'all. But so one thing that I found in, I'm hoping that this is one of our cross-platform crossover options. Look at me ignoring the deck. Uh, But so I found when creating a trailer, Michael, you were instrumental in helping me find the trailer editor for uh, the TV show. So we did that by going to a couple of trailer houses and you know putting it out there to the junior editors hey man who wants a side gig helping me do mine and so that ended up being a brilliant way to do it and get something extremely professional looking shout out to Josh Dragoda um and and yet affordable enough you know kind of thing but so that was time and money and you know networking well spent would it be a similar thing to go to the publishing houses and say hey man can i put that out there to get a letterer to get a colorist to get a penciler to get get a a quality team together well the nice thing is they're in the credits in the books um just like just like the the um you know it'll say like here that the, the, who the letter is. So the good thing is if you see something and you like the work, you can find um, their name right in whatever graphic novel you're checking out. And then in the age of social media, it's pretty easy to find people honestly. Okay, okay, awesome. Practical action step right out of the, out of the gate. I love it. Okay, quickly jamming through the rest of our overview. How long is a graphic novel supposed to be? Is there a, a specific length? Uh, you know, and how many issues make up a series, you know, or as I like to say, or is it keep going, you know, until as long as you're selling stuff and people are into it, keep making more episodes. Uh, tell me more. Who wants to jump in here? 
Is, sure is, there, perspectives. is is there a, a traditional number? I mean, I've, I've seen them all over the place. Okay. I think only if a publisher has a specific uh, requirement, maybe like if you're doing your own creator owned thing, then I don't know that there is a thing. I you know if you're doing um, traditional, so say I do a lot of work with a DC. If if you're doing comic book issues. So that's usually 22 or 24 pages and they're going to tell you that right off the gate like okay you're doing this thing in each each issue and then sometimes those issues are collected into volumes but so you have a you have a page count with that the way that like if you're doing a television show that has a certain runtime that's your runtime um but when you're creating your own stuff i is there really an answer it really varies by the publisher so i'm i i've got I, I just finished a series that was rain was five issues and we decided on that, but the page count was not fixed. So I did everything from 21, 22 up to 24. I mean, more than 24 per issue and it gets a little sticky. Um, I'm, I'm working on another one right now that the publisher requested four issues at 20 pages. So, and that's creator owned. So it really varies by publisher, but as far as graphic novels, I pulled one off my shelf. This is my favorite, one of my absolute favorite graphic novels of all time is this book called My Favorite Thing is Monsters. And it was an original graphic novel. And then I have Killer Queens, one that I did. And I just want to put them next to each other and show you that there is no standard on length <laughs> or size or any of that when you're thinking about graphic novels. <laughs> Unless those Individual Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say individual comic books. There, there is kind of, as Amanda was describing, there is a kind of a, a more of a structure to it. But honestly, if you're out there, use the format for comics, graphic novels, that's going to serve your story the best. If that means having a first issue out there, great. If that means doing a full graphic novel because it's a middle grade book, mm -hmm. then great. Do that. Okay. And that kind of dovetails into our, uh, who are the audiences that we're doing this for? Is, is it kind of it runs the gamut because you were just saying, hey, if it's for middle schoolers, then you're looking at something thicker. You're looking at the lumberjanes, et cetera. Um, or if you are looking at, I don't know, adults, you know, and or all ages, it, it, it you know, could be, you know, the 22 or it could be. And then are you also, in addition to that, in addition to what kind of audience are we looking at for these kinds of things? What, you know, then dovetails into what kind of storylines and, are you thinking of it when you're saying like, hey, this is gonna be, oh my God, I'm going on. Uh, is it a series of four, a series of five? Is it a one-off like the sleigh bells? Is it, I know, right? You know, shout out to Elusive Comics out in Santa Clara. They're my place, man, while I'm in the Bay Area. They are awesome, go check them out. And they have all of Bad Ideas comics. But so yeah, what, what, are, what kind of demographic am I looking at? Am I planning the graphic novels as a series of one, a series of five, like a massive big series of one, uh, five, 28? What, what are my practical action steps when I'm plotting this out on the page? Traditionally, it's 20 to 22 pages a book, about four or five issues for a storyline. That's not a hard and fast rule at all, a bad idea. I don't think we've ever done that. We publish 30, 40 page issues Sometimes our last issues are longer than our first issues. Oh, very much like streaming television works now, where the um, because it's not linear and they don't have to worry about advertising, the uh, runtime between episodes uh, differs based on what's necessary for that amount of story that they're telling. Uh, but traditionally, it's four or five issues, and it's 20, 22 pages each. I love Dinesh. We we're we're like it could be this, it could be this, and Dinesh is it's this, <laughs> folks. Let's go with that. And it's true. Dinesh is absolutely right about that. If you're studying out with your first book, 20 to 22 pages, four to five issues for your story arc, that's what you want to be pitching to comic book publishers at this stage. I hate that though. Don't get me wrong. I hate that. I can't, I don't, I don't do that at all anymore. Bad idea. At Valiant, we did that a little bit. And I would always find myself cutting important pieces, ending stories where they, where it wasn't helpful, especially first issues. You want to get your your audience completely hooked and whatever you need to set up on the stage for for your story to be compelling you want to do in that first issue so that is i think very traditional for marvel and dc largely for cost cutting in fact i think marvel's at 20 18 pages even now but it's purely a financial decision it's not a storytelling decision 
See, and this is what I love about our panels is we've got somebody talking about the financing. We've got somebody talking about the creativity. We've got somebody, you know, it, it, we're getting, hallelujah, we're getting all the, the important facts so that when people are showing up to go pitch something to somebody or move it forward in whichever direction they need to do, boom, they got their key terms. They, they can speak the language of everybody here from graphic novels. So good thing we're recording this, you know, that way they can review it again and again as needed. All right. So uh, do we have what storylines work best as graphic novels? Or it seems- All of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a visual medium. So like much like film and TV. So you want to think kind of visually at first, but yeah, it's- every age demographic, every genre, people do autobiographies, uh, to horror people, I think tend to think superhero right off the bat when they think, but that's actually such a small part of the whole spectrum. Fantastic. So, and, and I'm presuming within that, obviously certain publishers focus on certain types of stories. So everybody do some research, right? Find which one goes for which audience you're trying to get and which kind of storyline you're trying to tell. So just as you would with any other kind of agent or manager or production company or studio, uh, find what would, are appropriate. I, yeah, Jennifer, and I would jump in just to say that I think publishers are less um, hyper-focused the way that um, rep re representation might be, agents might be, managers, that sort of thing. And I, you know, I see, we, we all see it now where things, Publishers, what they want, what they want to publish is, is changing all the time. So I think it's even more important when you're pitching to understand, um, to, to read uh, books that have been published by the publisher that you're targeting to get the tone of it. And, you know, it's it, Scholastic isn't going to gonna publish your, you know, slasher. They're, they're just not. So there's some disqualifiers. But other than that, f figure out what they, what they like. And if your book if your pitch sort of fits the tone or the sense of the publisher, if it's not quite, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Boom doesn't, you know, would like to, to publish your, you know, your sort of smaller queer coming of age story, even though they have big Something is Killing the Children and Berserker and all these big books, maybe they want that. So, you know, don't restrict yourself necessarily to um, sort of a hyper-focused, this is, they published horror, so now they continue to just publish horror, because I don't think that that's the way that they necessarily want to look at it. Dinesh, can I jump? Thank you, David. Dinesh, what is your thought coming from the more the publishing side and also coming from the publishing and producing side? Um, you know, what, I'm, I'm not, you're going to be popular sure. tomorrow when people pitch to you, but, you know, so <laughs> what, you know, what, what, uh, how do you feel about when people are pitching to you and what kind of material they're bringing and what, what makes you say, oh, hello, yes, let's keep talking and converse? We, we do it differently a bad idea. We're, we, we internally generate, but we're the only ones that do that, I think, really. The other publishers, all my friends that run the other companies, they really have two, from what I understand, they have two major components they look for. Every publisher is an IP farm. They're all building comic books to monetize through film and television to well to, to advertise through film and television to monetize through merchandise afterwards so they're thinking about in the same way everyone on this panel and everyone watching this panel is what's succeeding for universal or hbo or warner brothers etc and how they can try and um, build something uh into that pipeline the other thing they're thinking about is their own brand so as david saying um someone like scholastic isn't really in the in the business of building slasher horror content but someone like boom might that might be their bread and butter because they've had success on that recently and they've got an audience looking for the next uh, story in that vein, in that genre. So different publishers have different uh, brands and so they tend to lean into that. They also, they're not huge companies and the decision makers are usually a small group of people and they have personal taste and they gravitate towards that personal taste. Image comics tends to be a very specific type of, um, um, actually I don't wanna say it because I'll get in trouble, but they have a specific thing that they do that is is um uh repetitive and uh, and i know a lot of uh, creators try and uh tailor their pitches to lean into that in order to get them approved an image and then change them when they write the, the books draw the book you heard it there change it after you get the approval y'all get in the <laughs> door first note to self i think that's probably good advice no matter which which 
part you're pitching, the graphic novel, the script, the what have you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that totally dives right into our next slide. How do I pitch this? What do I need to do? So uh, I believe a lot of our attendees understand how to put a pitch together for film or TV, um, but not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, we did a we did a pitch pitch thing a few years ago as a panel. Just how to do it. <laughs> so. Yeah how to create your deck and, yeah. and how to do trailers and everything and marketing materials. So everybody, it's on our YouTube channel. Check it out. Just made it yesterday. Uh, so pitching, how do we pitch the graphic novel? Um, so yeah, how do we do it? Uh, if one has the novel, how do you turn it into a TV or film script? If you're starting with your, your TV film script, how do you project that into a graphic novel when you're pitching it. Uh, take me through the steps, please. I'm curious, Dinesh, I'm gonna ask you I've got a the worst answer. What are you... The most depressing. Uh -oh. <laughs> please. <I'm excited. laughs> I know. This is, a question. this is a question that comes up a ton, and I, and I hate this question. What would you like to see from Amanda <clears throat> and me, for example? The <laughs> the only thing I've ever seen work for me, for, for Marvel, for any of the publishers, awful. And I've heard, I've heard other people give this advice too. You literally have to make the comic book, write it, get it drawn, get it published, print it, even if it's at a Kinko's and hand it physically to an editor or a publisher at a convention. And that's a huge bar. You've got to do all that work. You've got to take that expense. You've got to build the thing. And then you've got to hand it. You've got to get to a convention, which is difficult if you're overseas. And then you've got to find the right person and hand it to them. And then you've got to hope that they don't, leave it at the booth or forget about it or get sick because of got Concord or COVID or something and then don't read anything for a couple of weeks. It's, it's a difficult process, but it has worked. I remember at Valiant, I had these two uh, guys who would harass us. They would just turn up to the booth in costumes and funny jokes. And um, they were anything they could do to put their books in our hands. Um, and one of them was Donny Cates, who is now perhaps the biggest writer in comics. Uh, and he would just do that with every publisher. He had a book that he self-published and he would just hand it to people and harass them until finally someone read it and was like, you know what, let's give this kid a shot. And now he's writing Spider-Man or Thor or both of them. I don't know, everything. All right, a success story of how to hustle. Nice. Um, and I love the fact, Dinesh, that you're like, man, they just kept coming up and bugging us. Okay, note to self, we can bug Dinesh, everybody. But but a lot, Russell Donovan, who's, who's drawing Thor, one of the biggest artists, that's how he came, just people that I know at Valiant that we gave our break to. Jody Hauser wrote Faith for us, same thing. She self-published a book, um, handed it to us. I mean, almost everyone, Robert Gill, who we broke, same thing. It's a very high bar, but it does work. Nice. Um, that kind of dovetails into one of my other questions um, because I know for doing like, you know, TV or film, you're like, here's my trailer that I made. Uh, either I shot something and put it together or I did a ripo and here it is, you know, watch this for the two minutes. So. Uh, two questions on that. Would something like that be relevant to say, look, this is what I've done with this and I want to turn this into the graphic novel. Would showing something like that that you already have prepared in, in your digital back pocket is something like that useful? Um, and also <clears throat> you just show like, here are some example pages I've done of the style and the tone of the graphic novel or do I need to do the whole thing? I, I don't. I don't think trailers necessarily help. They can't hurt, but it, I wouldn't spend the time. Pages are helpful. The thing you've got to understand is publishers, editors, anyone that works in publishing, is crazy overworked. The beast of publishing needs to needs content. It needs at least twenty to twenty two pages a month for every book, consistently. So it's it's. There's no time. There's no time to have a family. There's no time to sleep. People get very sick in the job. Um, there's no time to look at anything that isn't fully formed. And even then, it's difficult. So. The best thing to do is yeah, get the art done, get the book done as much as, as close as you can make it so that the editor only has to sit down and read a book on a train or a flight back or whatever will help. rip -a trailers, they generally won't really look at them. There's no time. I don't know how you guys feel, David, Amanda. I, I, I was just gonna throw out that one other option besides physically handing someone a book is I got my personal start doing web comics. So putting right. things online, uh, easy, like you said, people are overworked. So this is something that comes to them that exists in the ether that they can see yeah. while they're like scrolling online. So like doing something that you put online, again, you've got to have it done. You have to, it ha there has to be art. You're doing something. Um, 
but that's how then I had editors approach me because I had content that was already out there that people could see. And that's that's how I started working for DC. Okay, I think, <clears throat> go ahead, Michael. No, it just sounds, what it sounds like is like, you really have to have it done. It's like these, these small pieces, it just doesn't work. It's most like you have to have an entire, like TV, in the TV world, you have to have a pilot, like not part of a pilot, like a pilot in order for them to really kind of look at it or- It can be short too. It could be eight pages, 10 pages. It's almost like if you're trying to break into screenwriting, you write a spec script, even if it's something crazy you don't think can get produced, but it showcases your voice. A lot mm -hmm. of times a publisher will say, we can publish this. We don't own this IP. We don't want this IP, but we love your voice. We love your style. We'll want to put you on something else. Yeah. What else do you have? Yeah, in my, my path, I'll, I'll talk about Kanto because my path, was sort of different than both Dinesh's um, just harass editors until they they buckle and, and Amanda's put your work out there until somebody you know finds you right um, so I uh, paired up with Drew Zucker who's my co-creator on Canto and he's the artist uh, by just connecting on um, social media and I really liked his work and so I reached out to him he wasn't available when I first reached out to him for a different project and then after he became available he sent me a message um, with this design of this little character, this little clockwork knight. Um, I'll show you that. I have visual aids. There he is. He, he, it was an early design of his and he had a, a story idea and he approached me and said, do you wanna work on this together? And so we got together, we sort of looked at the story and, and, and built something and then we partnered on it. So he drew, um, we had a full, so it's like a, it was like a formal TV uh, show pitch. So we had, it was, um, it's like an all ages fairy tale in the tone of like never ending story and labyrinth and, and return to Oz, that sort of thing. So we crafted the um, pitch document to look like an old um, like fairy tale book from the 19th century. So it had like weathered pages and we put a couple, it was inspired by Wizard of Oz and Dante's Inferno. So we put a couple of quotes at the beginning and some, you know, some draw outlines of Canto and then described what it was, described what the market was, who we were, what our experience was. And we had six fully finished pages, comic pages in that pitch. And that still wasn't enough because it's published by IDW and they came back and said, well, can you do the whole first issue of at least inks? So I wrote the script and drew, um, drew he did the art on the full first issue and that was that was when they um then considered it so it, and and that's sort of what my break was was sending this fully finished pitch package to idw that personally i was so passionate about canto and drew was too that we were going to make this book and put it out there whether or not a publisher wanted to do it and that potentially came through to idw and i think that's why um, they took it on because they saw the passion, they saw the appeal of it, they took a chance on it, and it's been fantastic for us. But that, I think, is probably the most traditional that um, folks in the chat and watching that path look at publishers' guidelines. Do they want five finished pages that are fully inked, colored, lettered? Do they want the full first script? Do they want the full first issue? Do they want, like, Image wants three issues done in the can, if not all of your issues before they publish it? Um, but as you can see, it's very three different paths to get to to get to the uh, same goal, which is to make comics, right? Absolutely. I love it. So there's no the good and bad, as we find with most of these things, is there's no one correct answer. You know, would yeah. that it was so that it was that straightforward. But this makes it even better in the respect that, OK, you can play to your strengths, you know, and so it, you're showing your passion, you're showing your your get up and do it. And then, you know, maybe you're also brilliant at, at showing up at, you know, comic cons and standing in front of Dinesh and going until he says, okay, give me the thing. Although I will add though, the convention was such an important part piece of my journey too, because I was going to San Diego Comic Con for a decade prior to even talking to anybody about being a, a creating comics. So by the time I was reaching out to folks, I could say, I've been, I've been to your booth for 10 years and I bought books and I love this book, IDW. I love Lock and Key. It's my favorite um, comic. So I was a huge fan of IDW before we even went in the door and build that groundwork so that you're just not, you know, the person off the street trying to throw Dinesh in the booth, some random thing like Donny Cates, right? He 
came to your booth tons of times. So I time never said playing, yes. And you never way. said yes. I never That's... said yes. It's awful. Biggest thing. <laughs> I feel, he never I feel lets his, me forget. I feel his pain. I feel his pain to me. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> Did you, when, when you were doing that, David, did you meet people at IEW? So when you sent the submission and someone responded at IEW, was it someone you had met physically? So uh, that's a great question, Dinesh. And the answer is uh, kind of. So when we pitched uh, Canto to various publishers, I made it a goal of mine that I didn't want to um, send a submission in anywhere cold. I wanted to make sure there was a, a name in front of the at for every email address I had instead of Smart. a submissions at. Um, and that was the result of the 10 years of going to cons and meeting people. And an artist friend of ours who is now, Ben Bishop, who is now the artist on Last Ronin for um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, just phenomenal, phenomenal person, phenomenal artist. He was working at IDW and I reached out to him and I said, do you know, who's your editor? Who's the editor you like or you work with? And he gave me the name of somebody. And so I emailed him and I, I, I might get in trouble for this, but I always love telling this anecdote where I'm like, man, I got a name. I'm ready. I am in. We're going to get right to the top of the slush piles. People are going to look at this carefully. It's going to, and he emails it back and he said, okay, great. I'll, I'll go ahead and send it over to the submissions uh, committee. And all I could think of was the dang wood chipper from Fargo <laughs> where the submission goes in one side and it just comes out as confetti on the other. So we luckily came out whole on the other end of it, but it, it's it's just a, uh, <laughs> you just lay all this groundwork and you're so ready to go. And then suddenly you're in the slush pile with everybody else. So you just got to keep working. Hopefully you were in the top third of the slush pile since it went internally into the slush pile. So you did something right there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. A couple of quick specific questions. Um, so do you do graphic novel comps when you're talking about pitching? Hey, it's similar to this one and that one. Um, curious to know the answer. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really, publishers are very concerned about audience. I'm sure Dinesha and Amanda, you can, you can pop in too, but they wanna know who they can market this to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And movies and TV. I mean, anything, anything, but but yeah. very much so other other books that have come out. OK, great. Note to self. huh? Um, and that also brings up the following question. Yeah, yes, bobbleheads. We're all going, yes, do that. Yes. Um, so when you are marketing your script as a graphic novel um, and or vice versa, your TV script and you're saying, look, it has fantastic potential in the graphic novel space and merchandise, et cetera. Um, who do you go to first? Or, you know, is it kind of whoever you can get a connection to, whoever you know somebody who knows somebody there? Do you want to be pitching it first as the graphic novel, or do you want to be pitching it first as the TV series? Do you, is there an order of operations to go to, or is it again, hey, fantastic, I've met this person over at IDW, let me call them up? I have thoughts, but I don't want yeah, to monopolize sure. the time. So Dinesh, Amanda. Amanda, what do you think? I I mean, so they're different, they're different mediums. So it's whatever medium um you're kind of I, I guess the I because I've I've gone lots of ways. I have adapted someone else's novel into a graphic novel. I have written graphic novels that are based on television series or films, and then the more the way I think a lot of people think about it, which is doing the graphic novel and then maybe it like gets optioned or becomes TV. And, and of course you could write a screenplay and then decide you wanna turn it into a graphic novel or vice versa. But I think they're different mediums. So if you have a screenplay, you do not have a graphic novel script. And if you have a graphic novel script, you do not have a screenplay. So it's really about thinking about the medium. I think, I think the best thing to do is to think about the medium that would best serve your story and do that first. Um, and then, I mean, in some ways, probably budgetarily, it's a, a little more feasible to put in time and energy and create an issue of a graphic novel to pitch than maybe like creating your a whole independent film or a pilot. But yeah, that's my 
I think it can be off-putting a little bit <laughs> to editors sometimes. If you come in, I mean, they, they want to see what we just discussed, which is they want to see the proof of concept for a comic book. Mm -hmm. And if your first approach to an editor is, oh, I have a TV pilot, I have a feature script that I think would make a great comic. Uh, to, if I was an editor hearing that, it would raise a red flag for me because I, I think editors want to work with folks who love comics and they're already going to be looking at your project as a potential to adapt. So you don't have to point it out to them and say, oh, this would be a good TV show because they're already looking at that, like, is this going to be a good TV show? Mm -hmm. um, so come in, the comps, it, this, is an, this is related to the comps, like what is, what is your book like? And that also shows them that you're aware of comics and you read them, even if you don't read them religiously or you've just dipped your toe in, being familiar with comics really puts an editor at ease when you're pitching your adaptation of the pilot that you've written as a comic book. Mm -hmm. Honestly, if you're pitching a comic book, I would not mention any of that. Don't mention that there was a pilot script. Don't mention there was a feature script. Um, don't mention adaptation potential. None of that. Laser focus on the comic and making it the best comic possible. And all those things are going to be already going through the head. So you don't have to tell them to, to think about that. 100%. 100%. It's most, it's most of, unfortunately, it's most of what people in publishing have to think about. Okay, well, great. Uh, this is such wonderful information here. I'm like, I'm, I'm just kind of soaking it all in. This is so great to understand. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to know, well, how long does all this take? You know, can I do this in six months, y'all? Can I have my cross-platform project all set and ready to go? Um, again, just kind of reviewing how long I know Dinesh, it took Bloodshot quite some time to get from its initial stages to the full film at the end, if you will, going from one to another um, outlet. And David, I know you were just saying for Canto that, you know, you guys are developing that. And so, okay, six months to a year, is that what I'm looking at? For, for making their comic or adapting? Uh, both actually would be great because again, this is a, a an area with a, in which a lot of us are not familiar. Well, doesn't it only take like a week or two to make a graphic novel? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. In and out. It can. Done. It can. <laughs> How good do you want it to be? <laughs> yeah. There you go, Amanda. How good yeah. do you want it to be? Because you can do right. one in a week. Yeah, <laughs> quick, you know, pick the two from the triangle. Good, cheap. But it's not, it's not, it's not a long period compared to the other mediums. It's not a long period of time. One of the best things about comics is that it does happen fairly quickly. You can, especially someone like Marvel or DC that are publishing issues of Spider Man every month, they generally have a three to six month lead time from conception of idea to it's on the stand. And there's, the wonderful thing about that is there's not a lot of time to shave the edges off, so you can have uh, a point of view as an artist writer or artist however you uh, are approaching it um but the adaptation component that can take a decade if 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 not indefinite at least that's my experience how about, how about you guys yeah i think that's about right you want it it's a little bit of trial and error um because when you're first starting out you probably if you're doing a five issue comic series and you set that date it's you, they'll they'll set a date sort of three months ahead of when they first reveal that you're doing the book with Boom or Dark Horse or whoever. And I think we had one issue, maybe two issues of Canto done when they first announced it. And we're like, we are ready to go. And the train leaves the station and you're on board. And within minutes, you realize that you're actually under the train. You're not on it because yeah. this thing is just going and you have to keep up. So, um, it's pro probably, you could probably make a full issue like Dinesh was saying in you know, three, four, five, six months. But if you're doing five issues that come out monthly, you probably should be working to put three together before you start publishing them, which could take you know, a six month lead time. And then to make a full issue, your five issue arc, it's probably gonna take, what would you, what would you all say, a year? From a year, start to yeah. finish? To do, to do it well. And you have to remember as the writer that the art is what is gonna take 
so much longer than what you're doing. So for the love of God, don't miss your, your deadline writing because you uh, taking a little longer on the script hits your artist in kind of a, a much bigger, much longer, many more weeks added way. <laughs> Because they just, I'm, mar I'm married to an illustrator, so I have to say that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, Amanda, you could speak to this because artists will set page goals per day, per week, and if you your script comes in three days after you said it would come in, you suddenly lopped off three, four pages from the schedule, so they have to jam it in now to to a shorter schedule. So the I I would say. Number one, don't miss deadlines. And two, don't, um, number two, don't make your artist unhappy. And mm -hmm. I think they go hand in hand. <laughs> this, is, this is all also if, you, if you're paying your artist, if you're breaking in and you guys are both doing it for free, I mean, then it's, you've got to, they've got a, probably a job that they've got to go to. So you've got to budget even more time. Mm -hmm. And that's something um, just because it's, I, I assume mostly screenwriters listening here that the IP works a little differently or can in the comic book and um, graphic novel community then. So if you've written your screenplay and then you bring on an artist because you've decided to turn it into a graphic novel, well, if you're doing it together, like Dinesh said, and you're creating it, they are now your co-creator. Um, and unless you have set up something differently from the jump where you're like, where their work for hire, they now own that IP with you. Um, so you don't still have the full creative control of your IP because you're creating it together. That's usually how it works. It can work differently. Different uh, publishers do it differently. Different uh, creative teams obviously can work out their own situation. But just so you know going into it that you're not suddenly like, what do you mean this is by this person and this person, your writer and illustrator, you're, you're considered co-creators. Right, right. And that's a full panel's worth uh, topic for a full panel because there are, <laughs> even within what, what Amanda said, there are variations where you're not giving up actual ownership, but you are giving a 50% royalty. Mm -hmm. So you keep creative control. There's, there's variations where work for hire or you give some lesser royalty. There's all kinds of ways to structure it. And if, you, if it's your first time around, um, it's very uh, challenging to figure out what's gonna be best. Mm -hmm. Oh, and um, Jen, do you want me to pull up the like the IP one? I just wanted to also say apologies. I, I'm dealing with some things that are kind of urgent. I'm going to jump off. I wanted to point out, Amanda, you actually have some fans on the Q and A section, so there's some questions they're asking specifically about you. Um, if you know you, you can jump in and answer those questions too when we get even to the Q and A. Um, but I want to say thank you, I, Jen. I know I have to jump, but I know you're going to run this. Um, it's a pleasure seeing you guys all. Thank you, Michael. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Michael. Michael. Yep. All right, so part two is going to be more about how to market yourself with the uh, graphic novels and your scripts, everybody. Hey, panels write themselves sometimes. Uh, so fantastic. Yeah, that was actually, we just, I, I was doing my best to look at the Q&A as I'm listening to everybody. So, um, but that was one thing they were asking, and we, we did talk about it a little bit. It was, yeah, how do I market my materials? And, you know, Dinesh, you're saying getting in, in your face is a good way to go. Um, well, even, even David talks about it. The minute that you announce a book, you're under the, you're under the train. That's what publishers, editors, marketing executives are dealing with constantly. Anything you can do to help them in that situation, they greatly appreciate it. There you go. Okay. And we know that social media is a great equalizing tool for everybody as far as reaching out to people, as far as being able to broadcast your own thing of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, hopefully even getting some, some teammates on there with you, being able to reach out and market through even looking at individual comic books and graphic novels for who's doing the lettering and who's doing the, the coloring and all of that fantasticness stuff. Okay, so this is where uh, David's about to get very upset with me and we're gonna see the smoke coming out of the nose and the eyes are gonna be what? on fire. <laughs> so what? can I use, the, when I'm uh, you know kind of cross-platforming this and I know we were just saying keep them as separate as possible to make everybody feel valued as far as like if you're talking to the graphic novels versus the TV versus the film versus the merchandising. Um, but so can't I use my graphic novel as like storyboards and you know aren't they aren't they kind of interchangeable? Flip the table. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly David has left That's the it. panel. This panel is over. <laughs>
this is a little bit of an inside uh, uh, ribbing that we're giving Jennifer. Um, I had some, I have some particular views about whether or not comics can be storyboards. And um, I, I don't, I would encourage everyone to not approach your comic like a storyboard. My philosophy, uh, and, I, and I have a feeling that the other panelists probably subscribe to something along these lines, um, is it make your story the best comic that it can be. And then when that's done, look at it and make it the best story that it uh, that can exist in the TV realm and the, or the film realm. Uh, so don't, if you have a script that's a TV pilot, maybe the pilot episode is your first issue. Maybe the pilot episode is five issues. It's make the best comic version of your story that you can and then start thinking about that adaptation. Because um, otherwise we'll see it. We'll see it when we read the comic. It, it'll it'll feel like a TV show that was just, you know, storyboarded into a comic. Any other totally thoughts? Agree. Did I clear the table? Totally agree. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think it's a trap. I really do think it's a trap yeah. when when TV and, and film uh, writers want to look at graphic novels and they think, oh, I just storyboard what I have. Uh, and it really, I, I have come to love comics so much. I came to the comics as an adult. Uh, so I didn't read individual issue of issue comic books when I was a kid. And I've come to love it so much and appreciate the storytelling of it that I get sort of, sort of protective over it. I want you to make the best comic story you can make. And then after that, let's, let's talk about its second life, its third life, whatever it's gonna be. And Hollywood's not precious. They don't care, they'll change whatever they feel like they want to change. You also have to build room for them to feel smart and say, we see what you guys did in the comic world, but we've got better ideas. And then they execute those better ideas and they don't look great and they have a better idea and they change it. And you say to them, well, you know, that's just what we did in the comic. You could have done that from the beginning. It's so common. Are you like, are you just following me around in my life right now? Right, exactly. Dinesh? That, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dinesh is old school. He's like, I show up in person. I don't just follow you on Twitter and Instagram. I'm behind you all the way, just taking notes. Watching, you know? Harassing you with my comic book. My last <laughs> month. So I, I really, oh, it's yeah. fun. It's fun. We're having a good time. Okay. So here's the other question that's going to, you know, get uh, some, some smoke coming out of people's noses here. Um, so the timing within the graphic novel, um, each, uh, see, I almost said episode, each issue of the graphic novel, it seems very similar to like how you would plot out the TV episode. And this is, you know, the, the ending of the first issue is kind of like that first commercial break. Is that, and obviously though, each issue has its own, uh, you know, acts one, two, and three, and two A and three A, et cetera. So, it's its own thing in and of itself, its own story, but it the rhythm of it feels very similar to how you would put breaks in for TV episodes. Good thing it's virtual, so David can't, you know. Am I right in that or am I just that Isn't wrong you, to leave now? I was answering a question on the Q&A. Oh, love it, okay, yeah, thank you, because those, those get away from me sometimes, guys, because I'm so enjoying listening. So I'll leave it to uh, Dinesh and Amanda to uh, contribute. To Amanda, pop what do you in. think? Pop in. I mean, I I don't think it exactly, I think if you tried to just uh, plop a graphic novel script into like final draft and then turn it into a screenplay, you would suddenly um, find that you had to like change a lot of uh, pacing and what happens in a scene and what doesn't and, uh, and timing and stuff like, um there is yes there there is a pacing element of it like you know you want to end an issue with sort of a, a cliffhanger and and you know follow an arc the way that you would in television so it's not it's not unrelated but i i don't know that you could just uh switch them out so it's not quite as straightforward as it appears when you're just kind of doing your basic research i don't think so yeah, totally. I mean, you want to have cliffhangers after each each issue, kind of like you want it for commercial breaks for for in in TV episodes. But that doesn't 
I mean, it's, I, I don't think it's ever going to be a one-to-one. -one. Your pilot has five acts. So suddenly your five cliffhangers are your five issues of your comic. So you, again, it's just going back to doing what is best in the comic form, what's going to be the coolest thing to leave on because, you know, in a commercial break, folks are, are leaving for three minutes. Um, and in a comic, they're leaving for a month. So until the next issue comes out, so you better hope that you got something that somebody is literally clinging to a cliff at the end of every <laughs> every issue, so that they come back. And there's also kind of like the timing thing. You know how you, with when with screenwriting, there's sort of the page a minute idea, but like say in a comic, there's like a splash page, which is where you've got, you know, instead of a bunch of panels, you've got a page of beautiful, and that that's giving you maybe an epic fight scene if you're doing some sort of action comic, which in a film you're going to be seeing like the whole fight scene whereas like that's just like it's a whole page of your it's just I don't know I it just doesn't it's just not quite the same I'm loving this information I'm also scrolling quickly through you know just trying to look at our Q&A because we do do our best to make this interactive um, a lot of these we've discussed about how to market yourself when you're pitching it what do you need to include in a pitch uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm trying to go, okay. Um, and, 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 okay. Um, again, I kind of feel like we've, we've gotten a lot of those done as far as like, how are you, uh, some of the questions we're asking about how do you find the artist? And I believe we, I feel we covered it decently by saying, go to the ones that are kind of comps as far as tone and style go, which ones do you like? find out who those people are and which publishers they are and you know social media i mean that's yeah. the number one and if you are looking for an artist for a graphic novel my suggestion is to um i was, I was at san diego comic-con and we talked about this and it, and i and it was don't come in hot don't come in like your first interaction with amanda is Hey, here's a DM. <laughs> I followed you five minutes ago. Can you help me make my comic? <laughs> no. <laughs> just, just be, just, just be a fan. Just be a fan of the art. Follow the person. Like posts, comments, whatever. Just be somebody that that's kind of becomes a known person, and then um, that that's when the collaborations happen. Um, not necessarily. Oh, I have this pilot script, and this is the first time I've ever talked to you. But can we please? collaborate on making an economy. Fantastic. I'm loving, this is, this is kind of the practicalities of cross-platforming. It's the same, whether you're looking at graphic novels, whether you're looking at novels, which we didn't touch too much on, whether you're looking at, you know, TV film, it, your process is similar as far as like, okay, get to know people, become a person to them, so that you know you're talking to individuals it's not some random oh lord who's that showing up on my my dm and i don't even know them you know somebody's yeah <laughs> there's a reason most people don't put their phone number on their email and stuff <laughs> all right so everybody we've got a couple of resources here let me pull up the share screen okay some resources so we have comicron which is the world's largest public database of comic book sales figures. Ooh, okay, we need this information. This is gonna give us a lot of practical, practical good things for when we're doing our pitches. Hey, look at you, David. <laughs> I am all about the visual aids. <laughs> which explains the gorgeous artwork that you guys have. Um, and then I love, again, how some books. Great. I can go to the library and they might even be online. I can go to, again, maybe they're right there at Elusive Comics, you guys, because they were such generous uh, co-conspirators with me and learning all my info for today. Uh, so you can get Making Comics by Scott McCloud, Comics and Sequential Art by Will Eisner. Look at that. Look at David showing us uh, what we need to get. Note to self, everybody's jumping on Amazon, but don't do it for another like five, 10 minutes, y'all, okay? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, it makes me sad, but it is that time of the day. We need to say a humongous thank you uh, to the Writers Guild Foundation, of course, for being amazing, amazing, uh, you know, people to team up with. So thankful for that. Final draft, y'all, in just a moment, I am going to be putting the survey link in the chat. Please fill it in so that you can get a chance to win a copy of Final Draft. We have four full downloads to give away. 
Hey, and as we know, it has the graphic novel component templates in there, in addition to our regular script templates. Um, and you know, those who also fill in the survey uh, can get a 30% discount if they want to just upgrade their software. Not too darn too shabby, y'all. Uh, and hey, panels are free, but donations are, of course, greatly accept accepted. Uh, so if you want to become a sponsor, do you want to reach a strong community of 3,000 plus creatives within our industry? So, of course, we are very happy to talk to people about sponsorship to help keep us going, keep these even more frequent and even more jam-packed full of practical information. So everybody, please do remember to give us shout outs. I am going to stop my share and I'm going to put in our chat the link for our survey. And hang on, copy. This is how technically proficient I am. And I'm gonna paste that in there. And that should do it, everybody. Please go there to our Google survey. David, I see you're already doing it. Thank you. You're looking so intense. Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right, everybody. I was answering questions. That's, uh, that's, it's so fun to see all these questions come in in the Q&A. Isn't it great? Yes, please mm -hmm. do keep answering, everybody. This is fantastic. Uh, so everybody, a massively huge thank you to Dinesh, to David, to Amanda, to the Writers Guild. And to all of you, 200 plus people that showed up today. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I can't wait to do this again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, hey, guys. If you want to answer you. questions, otherwise go to your next meeting, continue drawing, continue reading, continue publishing. Everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you.